Hello and uh, welcome to the second part of our talk on Grassington. So looking at the plan here where we finished off last time was at the Kilnsey Crag and now we're going to cross to the other side of the River Wharf to go to Coniston. Uh, so if we're coming down here past the crag and then turning this time left uh, across the uh, bottom of the valley, this was, say, was once a glacial lake along here and then crossing the River uh, Wharf right across to Kilnsey. So uh, Let's have a look at the bridge across there. Uh, it would have originally been a wooden bridge here that had been built by the monks of Fountains Abbey. And it's estimated it was built around 1199. They needed a bridging point here because of the Mastiles Lane that came over uh, Malham Moor, came down to their grange at Kilnsey and then needed to go across the river here. It then climbed Scott Ash Gate uh, to cross across to Nidderdale and then across to Fountains Abbey around 30 miles a day. Away. So what we see here is a bridge that was rebuilt 1790 to 1796. It's got a central arch and then two flood arches on either side of that. So this is the river wharf that it uh, it, it crosses. Uh, I say looking up there towards Kettlewell, and I say the first uh, thing that you go see, but when you go into the village of Coniston, is on the left hand side is the trekking centre. This is when uh, you can uh, hire horses, whether to go as a group or individually, uh, to go out onto the fells around here. And then as we go into uh, Coniston, uh, we meet the central green in the middle, then we're going to take the road that bears to the left. And just uh, on that corner, you'll see this uh, track. This is the track that leads up to Coniston Dib. Uh, Coniston Dib is a uh, dry valley. Uh, and again, at the end of it, last ice age, the ice sheets melted on top of the moor here and the water was funneled down here, coming down really a weak fissure in the limestone rock. Uh, and then you can say it's completely dry now. So let's have a look at this uh, footage of Coniston Dib. Uh, it goes right up onto the moor there and reaches the Dalesway footpath, the footpath that goes on this section of the Dalesway between um, Grassington and Kettlewell higher up the valley. It's a bit of a scramble in two places because there are true two dry water waterfalls, one at the very bottom, which is only about 15 foot uh, high, but again you've got to go up the rock and it's quite uh, shiny with people going up and down it. Then you come along a flattish uh, dry valley as you'll see on the film and I've had to put some old film at the end of that uh, because there's a scramble up again at the second dry waterfall at the top just as it reaches the uh, path at the top there. You uh, then find some uh, limestone pavement up there. Uh, I haven't featured Coniston Pie which is a uh, say uh, an outcrop of rock uh, which is great to stand on it's about half a mile away uh, from here uh, and it stands up in the corner of the valley so you can look up and down Wharfdale so let's have a look at this section of uh, a film
Close by, you can climb up the steep dip. Glacial meltwater carved it out, and it's now a dry valley. It's quite hard going with a few scrambles, but when you get to the top, the view is glorious. Here you will find limestone pavement. This is where the rock has been laid horizontally and rainwater has washed away softer rock along natural joints, leaving behind solid blocks called clints, surrounded by deep channels called grikes. Have a look in, as throughout the year rare plants grow in here. So the Church of St Mary is just uh, around the corner from the, from the Dib. It's on the very narrow road that goes up to Kettlewell. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, a hedged or it's got barbed wire fencing along it. It's a, a road that you don't really want to meet much traffic on coming the other way. Uh, but uh, just hidden in the trees, just really only a, a 30 seconds away from the a track that goes up to Dib is the Church of St Mary. It's the oldest church in Upper Water. It dates back to the 12th century. Unfortunately, it was restored in the mid 1840s uh, by uh, some architects from Lancaster, um, Paley and, uh, and, and Sharp. And basically what they've done is rebuilt these outer walls of the church and added the bell coat on top of that. You can say it's generally open uh, during the week and so you can actually have, have a look inside. This is from an, an older photograph I've taken. And here you can see only part of these two arches here. These are original 12th century arches. So these date back to the Norman times. And then we've got the more pointed arches here, which are sort of 14th and 15th century. because so there's not really much else to see in the church. It's a very unusual church because it's sort of long and narrow and even with the addition of the North Isle it doesn't really give that much space inside of it but otherwise there's not much else to see. And all those uh, things were taken out during the 1840s of Georgian box pews, there's a triple decker pulpit uh, and like I say the walls being rebuilt as well so uh, it, it is very simple inside. So this is the view you get when you cross over the bridge coming into uh, Kilnsey. That's the left route that we've taken to go up to the Dib. So really that's uh, just on the side of that photograph there. That's where the track goes up to the Dib just behind. Uh, we're going to turn right because this is a road that goes towards Grassington. It's about three miles away. Uh, we've got a, a, I guess a lovely seating area in the middle there and then a 17th century barn which hasn't been surprisingly not been converted into a house and it's still got its sort of large threshing floor in the middle of there so if we turn around this corner going down there the first thing we come across there is the Methodist chapel this was built in 1885 and was made redundant in 1980 but rather than selling it off the Methodist church decided to keep it and open it as a hostel and that's what still remains today it's £10 a night, uh, but you can't just turn up and pay your £10 because the minimum high charge of £100. Um, but it's open to individuals, it's open to groups uh, and organised parties as well in there, and it's all self-catering. Uh, I guess you'd have to go right across the uh, the bridge to Kilsey to go to a pub uh, to find anything which is nearest there, and, and Grassington's a bit, about three miles further along the road. And then there's a small village with a population of about 110 people. And uh, it's rather different from Kilsey. Uh, Kilsey, uh, the estate there, was sold to the Wade family after the dissolution. But over on this side, the, uh, the farmers bought the village of, of Coniston. And that's why I think there tends to be a sort of a much better class of, of farmer around here, the yeoman farmer who could afford to buy the uh, uh, the, the manor and that's what we see just coming down here on either side of the road uh, we've got the old hall there which is dated 1657 and across the road we've got um, Hempland's uh, uh, farm and that was dated uh, the, uh, on, on the farm itself 1687 there's another one on the barn for 1694 and the cost of building that farm was a hundred pounds so you can say that it was quite wealthy on this side of the valley but you can say the village has never particularly grown it's uh, you can say it's uh, did have a post office uh, um, near the green because otherwise that's the only facilities that it ever has so let's go down um, further down the valley. So we're going to follow the road from Coniston uh, down to Grassington. That's about three miles. There's very little to see on it apart from this area around here. Uh, we've got another dry valley uh, coming down there, uh, which is called um, 
Dibscar, uh, but there is, there's only the path that branches down off the top of it from the Dales Way and comes down to Coniston that way. And that's the only way you can see the top of it. Uh, from the grass wood, which covers this area around here, uh, there's no sort of permissive path across there, uh, but it's rather similar to Coniston Dib uh, as well. Another feature, we could say I couldn't find the film for, is Gatestill Strid, which is further along here. And it's rather like the Strid uh, at Bolton Abbey. It's a harder outcrop of rock down here, channels the full force of the wharf uh, through this rocky channel. And it could say it's just as turbulent as the Strid. And they could say in 1991, a kayaker came down here and was drowned in it, largely because that uh, once you've uh, tip to your kayak over is it's the uh, of currents underneath which trap you underneath there. Again, exactly the same as the Strid. So we're coming back along here, we can park uh, to visit these woods because there's some well laid out paths in them uh, because they are owned by the Yorkshire Water uh, Wildlife Trust and, and other bodies uh, around there. So you can actually walk around these woods uh, up here and because they be Behind them is the Iron Age field systems, uh, which are once sort of probably where the settlement of Grassington originally was. Uh, and there's humps and bumps in the ground. So that's where the sort of Dales Way footpath crosses across the top of that. And then the grass wood and barstow wood, because they're two conjoined here together, come down all the way to the road. Uh, if you're coming down from the Coniston Road, you can actually, there's some, quite a few car parking spaces by the side of the road and access paths into the wood and the Gazette exhibition panels in there. So I'm just going to show you a bit of footage now uh, and this sort of shows the sort of uh, um, sort of from the Bronze Age to the Iron Age things that you can find around here. It includes uh, these Iron Age uh, field systems up here and the Bordley circle across the other side of the valley but uh, we looked at it in uh, part one of this talk and I've also included in this the Yarnbury Henge uh, which is up by the lead mines above Grassington and again we'll see that later. That's all included in this bit of uh, uh, film. Look for signs of old field systems dating back to the Iron Age. You'll have to look carefully for telltale humps in the ground. Come late in an afternoon or when there's been snow so that the sun's rays catch the contours. Other signs of early occupation can be found in grass wood that you pass the top of on the walk. It is in fact three woods, barstow, grass and lower grass wood. They are looked after by the Yorkshire Wildlife Trust and the Woodland Trust respectively. High on a commanding crag are the remnants of a Roman signalling station called Fort Gregory. Another ancient relic lies straight across the valley near Bordley, another monastic grange. Here you can see from the track a stone circle, thought to be a chambered tomb of the Bronze Age. Another Bronze Age circle can be found above Grassington village itself, Yarnbury Henge. This is an earthwork a hundred feet in diameter surrounded by a ditch. This is thought to have been used for ceremonial purposes. So that minor road coming from Coniston ends up in Grassington because it's three miles away. Uh, and that, that's what's called Wood Lane appears here. Um, be, largely because it appears here because this is where it joined the old road that crossed the bridge further down uh, in uh, Grassington uh, over the River Wharf. We'll be looking at it in the third part of this uh, talk um, when we go and look at sort of the Linton Falls and that area around there. But this road here uh, is a much more modern road. It was built in 1853 and it twists up the valley side, making it easier gradient. But this old road that came up and you can still see see where it came down to meet the bridge, came straight off the end of it and it climbed directly up the fell side here and crossed across here. So this barn would have stood at the side of that track and then came into the square in Grassington itself. These properties here, because uh, they when they brought the railway into sort of the Freshfield side of the valley in 1902, it opened it up for development this side. So a lot of these uh, properties were built up here in 1920s and in the 1930s when people started to visit it and build house second homes or retired to here as well. So that's really what we see 
coming up the hillside to this area here. And that'd be why this shop uh, uh, is here uh, as well. So we're going to come round here, then do a U-turn effectively uh, to come up the main street into Grassington. Um, this is the formerly Barclays Bank, uh, and rather like a lot of places, are, uh, were bank closures um, ongoing at the moment. This closed in 2019 and is up for sale. And if you're coming in the car, is that if you come round here on the Hebden Road, a bit further along, is the Yorkshire Dales National Park car park it's two pounds seventy for under two hours and four pounds seventy for over two hours um there's parking in the square itself that's free and that's where that tree is but there's limited parking there and they could probably only hold 30 or 40 cars but it's well worth continuing up here because quite often if i come to grassington i bypass those go straight up the main street and at the top there there's a Devonshire institute carry on up more lane that's a lane that leads up to the lead mines and uh, just a little way up there on the right hand side is another free car park that holds probably around about 50 cars but we'll see that on the bit of film later on so let's go up the main street because this wasn't these are more recent buildings uh, i guess uh, because the old road entered into grassington just around here there were six blacksmiths workshops in uh, Grassington, uh, largely because of the lead mining industry up on the moors. So normally we just see well, one blacksmith uh, workshop in a small village uh, to serve the agricultural community. So these blacksmiths workshops weren't just serving the agricultural community, but all those things that they needed up at the lead mine. So spades and all sorts of bits of ironworks that they needed to prop up the shafts and other things like that. So you sort of, uh, that's why there's lots of them because uh, they will see another one higher up on the other side of the road because uh, it's got a supermarket here this was formerly a spa uh, supermarket but in 2020 as you see there it's now a budgeon supermarket it's not the only one because across the valley at Freshfield when they redeveloped the petrol station there they opened a co-op supermarket there these are only mini supermarkets but there's enough visitors coming into Grassington to sustain both these uh, small supermarkets and this range of independent shops that we'll see as we go higher up. Almost attached to Budgeons now uh, on that side of the road, the left-hand side of the road is Church House. Um, this was built in uh, 1694 and it's got some initials over the door there, SAP, and that stands for Stephen and Alice Pert who had it built. It later got the name Church House because there isn't a church, a Church of England church in uh, Grassington itself. Uh, that's St Michael's and All Angels down at Linton, beyond the Linton Falls. That was built down there because it was central to other villages as well, such as Freshfield, Linton and Hebden. So that's why it's down there. And I guess is that with the buildings, as we'll see later on, of two Methodist chapels and the Congregational Chapel, is the Church of England wanted to be represented up in the village as well. So these are effectively came parish rooms, and that's why it's called Church House, and I think it's still used as such today. Moving higher up on the left hand side uh, or in the middle there, we've got the square. This was a, a market uh, square here. It first got a market charter in 1282. Uh, and this was uh, gained by the Lord of the Manor at the time, Roger de Plumpton. Uh, he, I think, inherited the lands around here after the Doomsday Book. And they, they got them um, in 1282 and they were held on the Friday. The last recorded market held here was in 1860. Uh, but today, farmers markets are held on the second Saturday, uh, Sunday of every month. And you can say the square here uh, can be uh, fairly notable because Channel 5 have been uh, filming the series uh, All Creatures Great and Small here in 2020. A uh, previous series have actually been filmed up on Wensadale, which is nearer to Fursk, uh, where uh, it, it, it sort of really emanated from. So uh, Grassington has been chosen for that and obviously it will bring a fair amount of new visitors in. Across the road there, we've got the uh, post office uh, coming in there. So that's sort of really acting uh, as today we found in a lot of places as a bank uh, uh, as well. 
Next door to that, uh, we've got Robert Bunny's shop, because they're quite a, a stalwart of uh, Grassington. This opened in 1965, uh, selling sort of country clothing and menswear in here. Still family owned, his son, Andrew Bunny, now runs uh, that shop. Straight across the road in the square, we've got the fountain. Um, this is uh, down, coming down the main street. Uh, there's a stream that's culverted off the moor. This fountain, uh, Gusset, was, wasn't was originally here. It was stood high up in the square and uh, Gusset was uh, created in the 1890s and moved here in the 1920s. Um, this area here, the seating area around it, is actually on top of underground toilets and they were filled in 1976. So I guess you've got to go to one of the local restaurants or pubs around here if you want to go to the toilet. Uh, today, although the National Park uh, car park has toilets, it's also got a little bit of a visitor centre in there as well, because they're very, a good five, ten minute walk away from the centre of the square. We'll be coming down the other side of the square at, our, at the end of our tour around uh, Grassington. Um, so higher up now we've got the Devonshire Hotel, named after the Duke of Devonshire. He inherited the land around here in 1750, but in 1542, uh, the, after the dissolution, uh, the two Clifford brothers of Skipton Castle bought the estate of uh, Grassington, uh, and in 1597, just George Clifford owned, I guess his brother died, uh, and all in his inheritance went to George, and he uh, was a bit of a dissolute character uh, because he gambled and other things like that and had to sell off quite a lot of the properties in Grassington uh, to pay for his bad habits, um, but it was him that really set off on the lead mines up on the moor. I guess uh, he needed the money and needed to get it some other how. So that's how it comes to be known as the Devonshire Hotel today. Further up, we got the Helen Midgley shop that's been there for a long time as well. We've got the date stone above the signage there, 1891. And what we see are these little folds which come off the main street and, and other places around Grassington, large because of the lead mining industry again, is that some of these like this down here, Ashfield House, which is now a bed and breakfast, that's dated um, 18... Um, uh, well, it's, it's the 17th century. Uh, and um, that uh, was a farmhouse and really what the farmers did, uh, they could make a lot of income if they built other properties around it, to the cottages to let for the lead miners as well. And that's how they sort of come to be so hemmed in. Again, on Chapel Street, the Chapel Lane higher up, there's lots of lead miners cottages and they were built over fields and right up to the farmhouses themselves. So we'll see that a little later on. Moving up here, we've got, we've got properties on both sides of the road now. We've got the Foresters Arms there. There's three pubs in Grassington. They're really all, almost linked together at the bottom of the main street and Gars Lane the other side. Foresters Arms is actually uh, connected to the Gars Lane. There's a through path or a little uh, snicket along here called Brown's Fold. And that goes through the, to Gars Lane the other side. We'll be coming back down here. You can see where the other pub is on the other side. The Black Horse Hotel, and I say there's a tea room there. That white building is a fish and chip shop that we'll see later as well. Here's the second uh, blacksmith's workshop that we can still see today. It's quite notable for this uh, sign on the side. And that's a bit of a story uh, that dates back to 1766 and links back to Grasswood itself. Uh, a lad around here who was working either here or who was a blacksmith himself, uh, Tom Lee, uh, was coming back from the uh, pub at um, Kilnsey and was coming through Grasswood where he met the local doctor uh, uh, around here, Dr Petty, and for some reason he ended up murdering Dr Petty and uh, he was hung, uh, Tom Lee was hung at York and his head and body placed on a gibbet, uh, which then stood in Grasswood itself. So that's what the, uh, it comes up to there. You can see that black's a shop now, an art gallery up there. We'll see a lot of these other properties on the film as we moved up. So I'm just uh, choosing some of these uh, out. 
Gars End Lane is a one another sort of fold that comes off to the uh, side of there. And uh, can say Gars, it's an odd word, which is particular to sort of Grassington, is an old English word, um, uh, Gersing, uh, or it might have come from a Saxon personal name as well. And like I say, there's a, a mentioned Gars Lane uh, as well. And uh, like I say, you can come along here and it drops down uh, uh, the road does and circles around the bottom of Grassington coming out at Bulling Lane. And Bulling Lane is uh, links down to that uh, minor road that comes from Coniston as, as well. So we can do a circular walk around this part of Grassington coming from this area. But we'll see a lane higher up uh, just on here, Chamber End Fold, links comes down and joins this lane here. So let's move up and we can see where Chamber uh, End Fold is. It's this lane that runs behind this shop here. This has got a date stone here of 1631. This has got a date stone 1675. It's a much finer building uh, than the others. You can see probably sometimes by the, uh, the, the lintels on it um, because this was a sort of chamber that was used as a, as a, as a small court uh, and it was associated with the um, the lead mining industry, because there's quite a lot of legal work to be done about it, uh, because some of the uh, mines were let to subcontractors who then sub who then uh, employed miners uh, upon the moor as well, and so a court was here to sort of uh, settle the disputes uh, on 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 around the lead mining industry, and that's why this was originally called King Street, and then uh, after this was called Chamber End Fold. It's one of the more lovely photograph uh, streets uh, because of its cobbles uh, down here will come from the river at the bottom and. Uh, uh, say it's a, it's a lovely street and that's what people imagine uh, what it looked like because it'd been quite uh, hard work living here because there'd been no running water you'd have to get those from the water from the wells and things like that but they've been converted into those lovely cottages so that's looking down it meets Gars End Lane at the other end and then continues down so turn around looking up there we see the Devonshire Institute that stands at the top of the main street and obviously it takes its name from the Duke of Devonshire there. It was built in 1855, originally as a mechanics institute, and then has become, as it says there, a town hall. It's also become a theatre as well, last because there's the two-week Grassington Festival held here. And that's to have quite a big, well-known names come and perform in the village, uh, especially up here in the hall. Uh, say it was uh, extended in 1923. And again, if you look at the side of there, when we go up Moor Lane, is that uh, again, 1998 to make it even larger performance uh, space inside. We're going to come back along the road in front of here um, in, in a few minutes, but initially uh, we're going to turn left to go on Chapel uh, Lane, but the road next to it, just off this photograph, is Moor Lane. That's the one that leads up to Yarnbury and the lead mines. But we're going to go along Chapel Street al along here, it takes its name because there were two chapels along here and you can see you see one of it another art gallery up here as well i've come to about this look at the position down here because you can look down because it's built up on a on a sort of platform this street is and you can look down there and see where the second uh, or the first chapel that come across this is a primitive methodist chapel i can say look at the windows uh, in, in there and um, this was built in 1837 uh, I could say it closed in 1908, largely because there's quite an exodus of the population uh, after 1882 when the last of the lead mines closed and there was really no industry around it. So I guess uh, even at that early age is that the primitive Methodist lost its congregation fairly quickly and was then turned into house, uh, which it continues at today. But if you continue a little further along, uh, um, Chapel Street, you come across the Methodist Chapel uh, again. This was founded up here in 1811. Uh, it was refronted in 1825, so it got a slightly more modern front there as well, and still remains in use as a Methodist Chapel today. Continue along Chapel Street, 
This is where you can see one of the old tofts that belongs to the farmhouses around here. This is the only field that remains on Chapel Street because it, all the others have been built on with uh, cottages and other houses. So this is what it would look like probably 1750, being a series of fields running along here. That's Gars End Lane running along there at the back. So that's where it drops down to coming off those two streets and coming to Bull Ing Lane at the end. But let's continue on here. Uh, the next lane sort of up, uh, which has got this signpost there, that's the one that leads up onto the Dales Way. That's where you get onto the footpath that crosses across uh, the top of grass, uh, of grass wood and that goes across the top of Coniston uh, Dib and then goes across and drops down to Kettlewell. So that's where you need to go up there. It's a bit of a hike to begin with and then you're really walking on a fairly level platform across the fields. But we'll continue on Chapel Lane for a bit further. This is near enough at the head of Chapel Lane because uh, of this grand farmhouse here. Uh, what you can't see is on the inside is is the uh, got a, a it's got a 15th century wooden structure inside of that. It was refronted or encased in stone in the 17th century, and uh, it's a rather unusual. This one is because the rent from this uh, farmhouse and fairly typical uh, of, 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 of the age, uh, uh, it went to pay uh, for residents who are in Fountains Hospital over at Linton and we'll be seeing that in part three of this talk. So that's sort of, sort of fairly important uh, around here. But then we can see the sort of farm behind it because that is now Dale's Dairies, but it wasn't a farm. This was actually a cotton mill um, at one time, and it was founded, uh, I guess, in the early 1800s. Didn't last uh, very long, mainly because of the cost of getting cotton here. It would have come down the Leeds Liverpool Canal uh, and then brought up to here because they, it, they, it was probably the cost would have been prohibitive really of manufacturing here. And then in 1857 it became a dairy but it was only producing butter here and then latterly uh, in the uh, 1938 it became a dairy operated by William Oversby and they started selling milk uh, just locally in, in, in Wharfdale, uh, but it sort of ramped up production in 2003. It became a major dairy round here, and in 2011 it was renamed Dales Dairy. So these are the lorries that you can see all over Yorkshire. You say it's still family owned. Uh, it's David uh, Oversby, uh, the third generation of a family that now run the dairy round here. The lorries don't come through um, uh, Grassington itself, but they come down this uh, lane called Bull in Bull Ing Lane and enter into that sort of uh, Coniston, the road from Coniston. So it bypasses the centre of Grassington and then picks up the uh, the main road that comes through the village there. And they, these lorries can be seen all over Yorkshire. Uh, I don't think they supply into supermarkets. Uh, but that's Dale's Dairies. We're going to turn around now, go back to that junction where the Devonshire Institute is and continue across there, coming back into the, the square in the centre of Grassington. So I've passed in front of the uh, Devonshire Institute here and we've got two lanes here. We've got another Gars Lane. That's the one that drops down here. And this one, unusually, is called Low Lane, although it's higher than all the other lanes. But uh, off here, it does come high lane because before that sort of um, road was built at the bottom of Grassington in 1853 out to Hebden, the way to Hebden was up here, largely because it might have been drier uh, and it's more straight coming into that settlement because say, that's now disused and because there were just a number of properties up there so it's not really worth going up there. Down here uh, to the right and we could just see the corner of it is uh, Wood Street sorry, Water Street, uh, and that connects further along to Gars Lane, uh, just at the end here. This is a slightly older photograph. When I was here in September, it was jam-packed full of vehicles along here and you couldn't see really anything. But at one time, this uh, barn here uh, has been a shop for many years and it was in 2015 when I took this photograph, uh, but has now been converted into a house. Water Street comes out at the other end and joins Gars Lane, just to the right of this photograph coming in here. This building here, which has got a for sale sign on it, uh, was run by uh, Richard Gars 
as a theatre in the 1830s, because the population had been a lot higher then, uh, largely because of the lead miners in here. And so that's what that was, probably quite a rowdy theatre, probably, uh, for the type of clientele that might be around at that day. Uh, but opposite here, there's a little low wall that you can see here, because that's where the Congregational Church is. It won't be so called today, it be a United Reformed Church because they uh, united with the uh, English Presbyterians in 1972. But the Congregational Church is still in use. Note the date stone over here, it's got 1811 on it. That's the same time as the Methodist Chapel was built on Chapel Street as well. So uh, it gives us a, an idea of the amount of people living in Grassington at that time, probably when the uh, uh, lead mines up on the hill above were in full production because uh, they employed around about 200 people. But there'd be more uh, than that who were sort of had uh, jobs in the wake of that uh, people carted stuff around the blacksmiths and things like that. So continuing down Gars Lane, the white building there, that's the fish and chip shop open Tuesday to Saturday. Lots of people make a, a beeline for that as well. And where that brown fold comes out is comes out here because this uh, building here is a pub. It's got the sign outside of it there, the Black Horse Hotel. Um, this was built around about 1650. Uh, and uh, there's meant to be in the National Gallery a uh, portrait of one of the landlords here, a chap called, well, they call him Fresh Air Stubbs, but not been able to find uh, that image of, of him yet. He was a bit of a hunting, shooting, fishing type of landlord, so he have been quite a popular character around here. That's where Brown Fold comes out as well, because they've actually uh, could come down here at one time to film uh, because of that lorry down here. I guess it's unloading fish or uh, potatoes into the fish and chip shop. Now we're sort of almost back in the uh, top of the square itself. One of the things that you'll notice on the previous photograph is this large building that stands right at the top of it. It's called the Liverpool Warehouse, uh, largely because um, this is where uh, the owner of Linton Mill that stands next to the uh, Linton Falls down in the bottom of the valley, um, he, uh, William Cockshot, uh, he opened this up as a shop uh, to retail some of his uh, cottons uh, that he manufactured uh, down there as well. He called it the Liverpool Warehouse because again his materials came up the Leeds Liverpool Canal and then was brought over here to his mill. His mill lasted a lot longer than the one that's in the Dales Dairies, but we're going to say we'll have the history of that in part three of this. In the uh, 1920, uh, it became a cafe. That's when really people started to come uh, to visit Grassington. They came in probably at a weekend in their cars for a, a day trip out and things. Uh, in 2018, it became this independent bookshop, the Stripey Badger. Uh, they've worked on two fronts here. Uh, they got a cafe in one part of it and then the bookshop in the other part of it. So uh, hopefully uh, there'll be a lot of support for that in Grassington to uh, make it thrive. It must be very hard to run a bookshop uh, uh, today. And now we're back at the side of the square, the other side of the square that we came up from. And uh, this, as you can see, uh, if you look carefully, was two conjoined uh, cottages uh, let to lead miners. So we see here one of the doors and then the other door over here, which still acts as the uh, entrance to the folk museum today. These cottages were built in 1728 uh, and then uh, converted into the museum in 1979. It's open every afternoon from two to four o'clock and it's free to go round. So hopefully you'll leave a donation. Uh, downstairs, it's uh, as it would have been as a miner's cottage. Uh, so you've got the front parlor, you've got the rudimentary kitchen behind as well. They'd been all right here because it, it would just been a walk across the square to get the water. Uh, because the fountain would have been higher up in those days. Upstairs, you can see, uh, um, is, is more implements uh, that are associated with the area. So these are agricultural implements he here that were in use. And they've also got lead miners tools and other things like that. So really there's two sides to the museum. So if you're interested in sort of uh, uh, iron mongery, then the first floor is for you. And now we're back at the 
bottom of, of a square on the left hand side if we're coming down here and this is Grassington House uh, quite an important uh, building here uh, it was built for a Mr Brown in 1760 he was the promoter really of the turnpike road uh, that was first built uh, connecting through from Grassington through to Pateley Bridge. It would have been a very popular and sort of financially rewarding thing because at that time, uh, you say the Duke of Devonshire had taken over the lead mines up here and there were lead mines on Greenhow Hill and, uh, and, and in between as well. So there'd been a lot of traffic going along there uh, between Grassington and Pateley Bridge. And I guess he was probably part of a promoter of the road that went from Grassington down to Skipton, again, where a lot of material would have been taken. Uh, in the late 19th century, it became a hotel and it remains so today. It says under there, restaurant and bar with rooms. And therefore, we're now back at the bottom of Grassington to a sort of circle around it. So let's have a look at this film that looks at that route that I've just taken.
So the last part of our journey around Grassington is from the uh, village centre right up to Yarnborough. It's a three mile drive up here, so. The last part, the last part of our route is going from the village centre up to the lead mines up on the Yarnborough Moor. It's a three minute drive up there, so I guess it's two miles or something like that. Sets off fairly steeply to begin with and then flattens out because uh, it's a permissive road and it does say at the bottom that it's a dead end because it's quite a long way before you reach that dead end. Where I put point B there, that's where the Meyer house is. That was the lead uh, manager's house that was up here on the moor. Uh, and that's where you can turn right into the uh, car park, which is uh, occasionally, well, mostly open nowadays, there's a five bar gate there. And if that's locked, uh, then you can park at the side of the road. Uh, but I guess they're much more welcome to visitors up there on the moor to walk around the lead mining uh, remains. The Yarnborough Stone Circle is just about on this location around here. It's only a couple of minutes walk if you want to have a look at that, but I guess I got a photograph of, of that. So, this is the road that we're going up Moor Lane, but it wasn't known to the lead miners as uh, Moor Lane. It was known as Hungry Laugh Hill, um, largely because they probably never knew if they're going to make any money that day. Uh, it was quite a, a hard existence because a uh, investor would put money in and then probably not quite give a living wage to a lead miner. And the lead miner would work on in the hope that he hit a thick seam of lead because they could make quite a lot of money if they did that and a seam of lead could last for weeks for months for years uh, depending on how large the prospector had the area around it so you know it probably went from boom to bust uh, for some of those lead miners depending which shaft they were working on so that comes up here just to beyond that little barn there that's where the car park is uh, that uh, you can park in but it's free and then leading up to there so then coming up and looking at the where the site of the hinge is, you can see here, this is from a Google aerial view uh, because I've shown that bit of uh, footage before because it's fairly flat to see ar around here where the hinge is. You can see it's circular nature around there. When I had the drone up in this area around there, there were too many cows in this field or, or, or already. So that's why I've not actually filmed it, but just that uh, one from the thing. It is accessible because the car park uh, that you can park in or on the side of Moor Lane down here, there's a gate here, which is where the uh, path goes in uh, and you can cross, you can see on this uh, photograph here, where the path crosses and then through another style or a gate there and across here into the sort of the lead mining area. So that's a permissive path. That's where I walked along to actually film it a number of years ago. But there's really not much to see, but its importance here is of its sort of historic age of it. It's late Neolithic. That means it's around 5,000 uh, plus years ago. Uh, and it was thought to be a site of sort of a, a meeting site where rituals were held. It's 20 meters or 60 foot uh, around the circumference of that. And it's got a, a, a shallow ditch, uh, we've probably, mean, uh, probably been a lot deeper uh, thousands of years ago. And it's that ditch then they dug out that formed a circle, a sort of uh, a banking around the outside or the inside of the circle around there. It's about 15, uh, sort of uh, three foot uh, wide, uh, that is up there. And it's sort of made of stone and chalk. It probably might've been much higher and because it might've been ornamented uh, uh, as well, uh, but it's made of sort of rock and turf today. Uh, but like I say, it's of the Neolithic age. And I say, we've looked at the Bordley uh, circle across there, which was Bronze Age. We've looked at the Iron Age field systems in the area as well. And so, because like these have been tracks that came across here for meeting points for many people who lived up on these tops, because uh, they probably when the climate was a lot warmer all those thousands of years ago. So we're coming up here and this area, because we've just caught the bottom of it here, is where the lead mines are. You can come up here and park where these people are down here. They were meeting up for a, a picnic. Uh, some came from Hebden and some came from 
Keithley because they, they wondered what I was doing. Uh, and uh, there's this root of um, information panels. I think there's about 16 of them. Uh, you need to sort of take a photograph of the main one because you can't really see where the next one is uh, unless you're sort of going. So this is where you can park your car in this area just around down here. So this one says it's the shallow shafts around here. There's one for the washing dub, uh, which is a bit of a uh, small sort of pond reservoir. And there's another one for the tramway and there's one for Meyer House as well. So there's quite a few in this first vicinity uh, where you're going to come in uh, to unpark your car around here. But then the others are quite a long way away. This is down here, that's Hebden Gill. Uh, that's where the beck goes all the way down to Hebden. So some miners, I guess they would come up from Grassington, some lived in Hebden and would have walked up the gill to come to work as, as well. So Hebden was quite a bustling town as well. But here we see the initial sort of uh, type of pits that they were digging. Um, the trouble with the lead is that there's really nothing to be found uh, in the sort of uh, first part of it. You've got to go down to about sort of 18 foot. Uh, so there's sort of fairly uh, poor lead in those sort of first few feet. So you actually make quite a large commitment to dig down here. So lead uh, really was created, I guess, going back 300 million years ago when the limestone was leveled, uh, laid down in horizontal um, seams. And this was when the Yorkshire was near enough the equator and there was a sort of warm sea around here. And then that deposited the, uh, these. But then coming uh, millions of years later, we had this sort of uprising in Scotland uh, and that sort of uh, melted the sort of uh, um, water up there and it came down here and created a river delta in this area and so this led behind sort of mudstones and shales and things like that and that's what gives them a uh, quantity of coal around here as well but it's fairly poor coal uh, but it's a reason for the uh, mining of lead up here as well because that was easy to get to as well and transport down to this area and um, later on we had these uh, huge sort of uh, earthquakes around here that created these the, the Craven Fault. So there's really three of them. This is sort of upper, middle, and lower. The lower Craven Fault we'll see in part three down at Linton. But when those earthquakes appeared, is that it released water from deep inside the Earth's mantle. And inside that water uh, was all sorts of uh, um, ores and uh, minerals and things like that. And that interacted with the lead up here. And when that water cooled, it left behind crystals. And this formed in this area, galena. And galena is lead ore. It also left behind other deposits as well. And these include calcite, floor spar, barites, and pyrites uh, as well, uh, which were quite important for a lot of industries, especially the textile industries uh, and pharmaceuticals uh, as, as well. Uh, and so it wasn't just lead, but it was principally lead up here. We'll see is that they came back uh, to recover some of those other ones a lot later on. So lead had probably been mined up here uh, the simple, easy to get lead in the top surface, probably by the monks of Fountains Abbey, because they needed vast amounts of lead, because I think most of it came uh, up from a Greenhower Hill area above Pateley Bridge. They used it for roofing material, they used it for pipe work and things like that. But principally when George Clifford, uh, the uh, Lord of the Manor in 1597, he wanted money and he also had lands in Derbyshire and he was lead mining down there. So he brought some of those lead miners up to the Grassington area, 1603, maybe 1605 uh, to prospect for lead. Uh, but didn't look up here initially, but they were uh, mining for lead down by the river and so they sm found small quantities down there came up here in 1637 and started mining for lead up the, up here. And uh, as we we'll see, 1642, that sort of court uh, room came into being in Grassington. And that was to say, uh, uh, arrange, uh, do these legal arrangements between uh, the, the landowner, such as the, um, as the, uh, as the Cliffords then, because they own the mineral rights, which go underneath the ground for, I guess, until they come out at the other end, I guess, or into the middle of the earth. And uh, they then uh, let parts of these areas off 
to uh, prospectors, I guess, people uh, who hope to make a lot of money uh, from these. And that's what, uh, as I mentioned before, went through the courts uh, down there. But it really changed in 1750 when the heiress to the Clifford Estates married the Duke of Devonshire. He seemed to have a lot more money behind him and actually sort of industrialised this area. So he was doing it on a much more commercial basis. And that's really what we see from uh, here up on the, is these works up here. And so the, uh, there's sort of two sort of uh, areas of lead mining here. There's one on this side and then the other I can say in the background over there on the other side of Hebden Gill. And they can say the lead veins here about 500 metres wide, that's 1,550 feet. They can say then you have to dig down to 18 to 20 feet to actually to reach that vein. And those veins could then go down as deep as 260 feet below that. But the trouble with the mining up here is that at around about sort of 75, 80 feet, they met the water table. And that was what stymied production really until the 1790s, early 1800s, uh, because uh, they didn't have the technology at that time to pump out water uh, in order to access that uh, lead at a, at a lower level. And uh, so we see some of the other buildings coming after that date, sort of the early 1810s, 1820s, when new technology was brought in here, uh, sort of winding shafts and things like that. And um, the, uh, then the shafts here could come much deeper. So these are the original ones which have been backfilled. I wouldn't go down one because uh, I guess the bottoms of them are fairly unstable. They go down about 10 foot or it might be quite hard to uh, climb out of them as well. And so you'll see this is the access road that you walk along uh, to uh, pick up the, uh, where the smelt mill was and where the chimney is on the highland, uh, on the high land. Uh, that's called the Duke's uh, Road. Uh, so that was to open up the access to the other side of the, of the valley there uh, and where they're building these new um, uh, uh, mines down there around an area called Colgrave Reservoir which is fairly close to the chimney on the highland up there. The reservoirs was needed up there because they, when they extracted the lead ore it came with a lot of rock and they used uh, water to break apart that rock so they're only smelting uh, the lead ore uh, with less of the amount of rock. That's why there's lots of huge uh, heaps of rocks up there on the sky, in fact all over this area around here because that was a rock that was left in situ and not taken down to the smelt house and so that's the, uh, the reason why the reservoirs up there whereas because they lower down here it will be brought down and because they've broken apart in the Hebden um, Beck itself and that's why you see mountains of waste material in that area as well. So we see a lot of rebuilding come the 1790s. This is when sort of the first uh, new technology was built uh, in here. The uh, chimney on the skyline, that dates from 1849. The smelt house, uh, Cupola Corner, there's not much to see of that. It's just got the outer walls of that. And you've got to look at the uh, uh, information panel in there. But the flue is a major feature of this because it goes from the smelt house up to the chimney on the moor. That's 1,640 feet or 500 metres long. It's, you can actually walk it in part or climb in it if you're sort of uh, pliable enough uh, because um, it's, it's all made of an arch, a stone structure inside. And part of that is that the um, lead condensed on the walls of that flue and they sent children up there to recover it. So probably quite a dangerous job uh, because obviously you'd be scraping it off and breathing in lead fumes, and lead particles at the end of that. So the height of the industry around here was that sort of early part of the 19th century, around up to probably 1850, 1860 or something like that. And there were 200 men employed up here working on these various uh, shafts up on the moor. Uh, and then suddenly, in 1882, it was all over. That was really for two reasons. One of the principal reasons is that much cheaper lead was coming in from Spain and South America and other places like that. And it was harder to get the lead up here, which made it very expensive. So it's all over there, but come the uh, end of the First World War in 1918, they decided to go for lead mining again, again, up near the chimney on the far skyline. But that didn't last particularly long. That was over in 1927. 
And again, 1955, they were back here. They were looking at these, the waste uh, around here, all these piles of rock. That's why the road tracks here are much bigger and wider than they would have been. Uh, and like I say, they were recovering barites and flower spar uh, coming off of these remains uh, up here. So that's what you can see. You, see, you can follow this route around, or you can, say, uh, you can say photograph that first sign to give you where the other ones are. And it's about a four mile uh, trek around there. It's fairly level. I, I know you're dropping down to Hebden Gill and walking up the other side, but there's lots of interest to see, uh, as you'll see from this footage. Again, setting off uh, from the centre of Skipton, Skipton, uh, Grassington, and then coming all the way up to here. And then I got a drone across so you can see where things are.